Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about research to practice, how science is helping people with mental and substance use disorders. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. H. Wesley Clark, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Thomas McClellan, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Solutions, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Alexandra Loday, Director, Center for the Study of Addictions and Recovery, National Development and Research Institutes, Incorporated, New York, New York. Dr. Candace Peterson, Associate Scientist, Evaluation Shared Service, University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Clark, what does research to practice mean and what does it mean for a methodology or a practice to be evidence-based? Research to practice is a concept that captures uh, development in the research community with regard to various aspects of, uh, in this case, uh, substance abuse or mental health care in an effort to increase the ability to positively affect the individual who's affected by it. So evidence-based then is mobilizing administrative, clinical, and research information to enhance the quality of care and the effectiveness of care in, in order to produce the best outcomes associated with uh, providing care. So when people present for care, they're getting the best care possible. And Tom, in the, in the field, how, uh, how much of this is going on? What is the percentage of people that actually do evidence-based uh, practice? Well, it's a good question. As uh, Dr. Clark said, uh, nobody can argue that you need more evidence for the things that, that uh, you do. Every parent demands it for treatments for their children. Every treatment provider can see that things are working and they really wonder why do we need researchers telling me. And, and the reason for that is they don't see people who don't show up again. They don't see people who uh, have left treatment and relapsed. That's the kind of stuff that research can inform practice about. But it's equally important for practice to inform research. Dr. Laudet, why is the um, dissemination of research findings to practitioners in the field of behavioral health an issue of concern? It's an issue of concern because, um, generally speaking, as researchers, we've had a tendency to do this in a one-way street so that we come into a treatment, we either design an intervention or we come into a treatment uh, organization as experts, we tell them what we're going to do or what they should be doing without really consulting with them in terms of what they need, just like what Tom said, it really has to be a two-way street. And so I think what has happened so far many times is that there's, it's really two different uh, specialties, if you will, and what the researcher is doing is really not that relevant to what's going on in the field for a variety of reasons. A lot of the clinical trials, for example, have very exclusive um, criteria so that the majority of people that a treatment agency would see are not included. That's the first thing. And also a lot of these studies that produce the evidence-based are uh, done in a, in a sort of a cocoon environment that doesn't mirror. And then the research findings are uh, reported in scientific studies that nobody reads or very few people read, A, because people don't have the time, B, because we almost purposely use language that nobody understands. So unfortunately, I think these are key limitations to the, the real translation of research to practice in the field and not just in behavioral health. Mm. Dr. Peterson, is that true for prevention as well? Yes, I would say it is true for prevention as well. There are um, People who work in real-world settings, who are, who are interested in helping prevent problems from occurring, in this case, substance abuse or mental health uh, issues, and they have a lot of constraints on their time. They have a lot of constraints on other resources. Could be money, could be technology. Um, and in terms of bringing research to practice, 
things that are done in a, a laboratory or academic setting, if you will, sometimes are not readily translatable into real world settings with those constraints happening and with uh, a variety of audiences that are in a community setting. So uh, yeah, I think the same is true in the prevention field as well as in the treatment mm -hmm. arena. And Tom, in terms of, of what we are studying, um, give us a brief um, overlook of, of what we are currently studying. I know NIDA has done a lot of research on the brain and so on and so forth, but what other areas of interest um, should a patient, for example, be cognizant about? I think the best way to think about it is the different stages of, let us call it, the course of, of addiction from prevention, as uh, Candace was talking about, through early intervention, through treatment, through continuing care, and ultimately recovery. There's an active program of research from the basic through the clinical through the translational in each of those stages. In, in prevention, community-oriented studies are, are, have been undergoing large-scale national trials. Family-based uh, studies have also been done. Lots of work has gone on in the brief intervention area in medical settings, but now increasingly also in schools and private uh, office settings. Uh, treatment has had the, the, the luxury of having the most research funding for the longest time, so medications, interventions, uh, of all types have uh, been going on and, and there's been a real uh, burgeoning literature in that field. Uh, we're starting to catch up in the continuing care and the recovery areas, but there needs to be more in that area. And Dr. Clark, SAMHSA um, originally was founded or, or authorized to really take the science and develop methodologies or evaluate methodologies. Um, how has that been uh, undertaken in recent years? Well, what SAMHSA attempts to do is work in partnership with our colleagues at the National Institutes, National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, and other NIH uh, uh, institutes. And that science that they developed, as was pointed out by Dr. Law Day, is very rigorous, uh, but uh, translating, as uh, Dr. Peterson pointed out, into practice is uh, complex. So using our addiction technology transfer centers, we need to educate people about the science. We have to influence the behavior. When we use our funding to, shall we say, prime the pump, uh, allow community-based organizations, uh, state authorities, county authorities, tribal authorities to explore the implications of the science that's been developed by researchers uh, for community practice. Because as was pointed out, may work brilliantly in the laboratory or an exquisitely controlled study, but doesn't work when generalized to the uh, general community. So what we want to use our portfolio for is to help facilitate that information sharing so that we can determine the utility of the science and so we can provide feedback to the scientific community about uh, whether the refined techniques that they have explored actually can translate when general practitioners, if it were counselors, psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, and others are actually doing things with uh, the protocols that have been developed. And Dr. Peterson, what does the family of a person who needs treatment or someone who, who, who is looking to get into treatment willingly uh, need to know? Well, there's a lot of different ways to approach treatment. And um, it's important for an individual or a family who's looking for treatment um, to, to know that there are different ways to approach it and that there are um, evidence-based ways to approach treatment. So they want to look for things that not only are accessible and affordable to them, but also some something that's going to fit with their needs. Um, if the person is, for example, very motivated, then um, there are places that they could go where um, would, would fit that stage of readiness. If the person is uh, not really that aware or um, doesn't agree that they have a problem, then you might want to, you're going to start at a different stage with that person. 
So you want to look for something that fits with that person's um, set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Were you able to have that flexibility in your own recovery, Dr. Peterson? Well, my own recovery was quite a long time ago, I think about 26 or 27 years ago now. And I had the good fortune of um, being able to go and get help from people who really knew what they were doing in terms of working with where I was at to move me along um, in my own intrinsic motivation to want to get better. So um, I was fortunate that that was true at the time. Also, when I uh, got treatment, there weren't the uh, limits in terms of the number of visits that were paid for or the length of time that I could stay. And that was of great benefit to me. Which are a whole other issue uh, in terms of the, the provision of services. Well, when we come back, uh, I want to touch upon the various types of treatment that are available and the research behind it. We'll be right back. SAMHSA's approach to moving research to practice in the last 20 years has really evolved. I think we understand now that there are in fact specific evidence-based practices that work better than other kinds of practices and so we are trying to push those. On the other hand, we also understand that there are things we don't know. So we're also trying to look at the ways that services can teach us something about research and about the need for evidence. Frankly, the best thing we can do is encourage evidence-based thinking so that clinicians use some combination of the research documents, uh, the information that's available out there, as well as their own clinical experience, and frankly, taking in to account uh, what the consumer, what the person in recovery, and their family is needing at that particular moment. One of the most important things about uh, trying to get uh, information to the field is also getting information back from the field. So collecting data from practitioners, from consumers and peers, and digesting that data and returning it to the field allows us to make sure the practitioners have a good understanding of their impact. It also allows the uh, funders to understand that we are making a positive difference. it's important for me to talk about my recovery from substance abuse. If people see me talking about how I recovered, they see other people talking about their recovery, I think it really helps to remove the stigma that's associated with addiction and with mental illness. People can see that um, it doesn't have to be uh, only this type of person or that type of person or um, of this age or gender or race or class or, or what have you. It can be anybody. And anybody can also recover, given the right support. Dr. Lode, let's talk a little bit about integrated treatment for persons with co-occurring and substance use disorders. Well, um, the majority, uh, by which I mean uh, half or more, of individuals who have a substance use problem have a diagnosable mental health uh, disorder and vice versa. And historically in the field up until some 20 or so years ago, um, individuals, come, individuals who were duly diagnosed who were seeking help for one disorder but had the co-occurring disorder were essentially falling through the cracks because both of the, the different professions, if you will, which have very different trainings and therapeutic ideologies when not only not communicating, but very often excluding the individuals who had the two problems. And so most recently, um, meaning by the last two or three decades, integrated treatment has been recommended, it's been implemented, it's been, um, it, it's been evaluated as well. And when you think about it, it makes an enormous amount of sense because as professionals, whether it's researchers or clinicians, we have the luxury of looking at the mental health or the substance use disorder, but the affected individual is one person wrestling with both at the same time. 
And both of these problems are dynamically associated, if you will, so that the, the improvement in one area will affect improvement or deterioration in the other area. The other thing I would, I would add is that um, for people with both a mental health issue and a substance use disorder, um, as you said, in the past, they were treated kind of separately. This one, this one, there was kind of some argument about, well, which came first? We need to address the substance abuse issue before we can make headway on the mental health issue. On the flip side, the mental health practitioners would say, no, we need to address the depression or what have you before we can really make headway on the substance use. And I think what people are really beginning un to understand, especially in the last decade, that they have to be treated at the same time, and not just treated at the same time in parallel, but treated at the same tr time in a very integrated fashion. Tom. If you Google du dual disorder, you will see hypertension and diabetes, but you never hear problems in treating those two disorders. I think the reason is, Doctors, nurses, pharmacists are educated in both. And very importantly, the money comes out of the same pot. So, so often there's a separate pot for mental health money and substance abuse money. And it has produced an unnecessary, really divisive uh, conflict in the, in the education and in the delivery of, and, of yes. people. And all the way down to the community level where there are demonstration projects to use evidence-based practices in substance abuse, abuse or in mental health disorders. Uh, communities get funding from the federal government to do these demonstration uh, projects, but the funds have been, in the past at least, siloed so that they could only address one or the other at the same time. But I think one of the reasons that the demonstration grants have been separate is because, indeed, the insurance financing has also been separate. It's an important exactly. thing to keep in mind. There's also another issue that we also have to keep in mind that we're addressing with our screening, brief intervention, referral, and treatment. While it is true that the issue of co-occurring is the expectation, not the exception, for those who present to treatment, majority of the people who have uh, substance abuse problems or mental health problems don't present for treatment. So 95% of the 20 million people who meet criteria for substance abuse perceive no need for treatment. In other words, they're not in the treatment setting. So if we look at integrated treatment, we're looking at people who tend to have more co-occurring because the larger group of individuals actually don't meet criteria for co-occurring. And so as we approach the treatment of both mental health issues and uh, addiction issues, we have to look at the whole universe and we have to strategize how we're gonna deal with that larger universe because we're not gonna make the problem of substance use disorder go away. And then the final thing is that there are also community-based issues that are tied to substance use disorders that are not true for mental health disorders, uh, criminal justice issues, child welfare issues, which are much more powerful in the addiction arena uh, than in the mental health arena. So that creates a demand for an alternative pathway, which from a clinical point of view is not terribly mm -hmm. effective, but that demand is codified, if you will, at the community level. And we have examples, however, of states that have indeed approached the subject in a very novel way, such as Connecticut. Shall we talk a little bit about what Thomas Kirk did and, and how he was able to, to bring together or attempt to bring together the, the two fields? Well, that is happening, and SAMHSA is endorsing that, but we also have to step back and look at the larger uh, environment, and that is making sure that whoever presents for whatever problem gets those problems addressed, and making sure that we expand the reach of our interventions so that we're dealing with people at various stages of the problem. If we only wait until the individual's problems are so severe that they have to engage in treatment. They tend to be more complicated, they cost more, and the interventions tend to be more uh, uh, complicated. Yeah. So the whole notion of how you best address this issue is uh, dependent not only on demonstration grants that organizations like SAMHSA would pursue, but also the research that the NIH would pursue and some of the services strategies that ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, would pursue. So we all w operate together so that we produce the outcomes that the larger society, as well as the individual. The real challenge is, is 
certainly with the individual who seeks treatment and, and where he or she presents. But there's also a whole host of issues in terms of policy, and you yourself, I've just noted, funding streams that really also, right, Tom, that also need yes. to be uh, addressed. We, we talk a lot about evidence-based clinical practices. There's certainly a need for them. There's also a, a, a crying need for evidence-based policies, policies that take advantage of what we know now that we didn't know 40 years ago when many state and even federal policies were, were written. Um, insurance is different. Uh, the state of the science is different. The population is different. Um, and it's, that's a place that's going to set the occasion for uh, the, the kind of array of quality services that uh, people deserve. And Dr. Lode, it's even more challenging as we are seeing changes in the health care reform. Uh, system and how that's going to play out in, in terms of how recovery services in particular are going to be offered. Can you speak a little bit about that? I actually see an enormous amount of promise from the, the standpoint of delivering uh, recovery support services in the context of healthcare reform as it's written right now because, uh, well, there's a number of reasons. Of course, there's parity and there's also the fact that according to numbers, of the 32 new million people will be insured, six to 10 million of them have a behavioral health, uh, either substance use or mental health problem, so that's one part. But when you look at, uh, in addition to that, several of the key points of healthcare reform are extremely consistent with the recovery-oriented systems of care goals and, and um, uh, model that Dr. Clark and SAMHSA have been embracing and, and promoting for uh, many years at SAMHSA, for example. Uh, screening, early intervention. You have person-centered or patient-centered in healthcare reform. You have uh, integrated care, which uh, for healthcare reform is primary and behavioral health care, whereas in some size, mental health and substance use. And then you have the continuum of care model, the chronic care model, which would, in healthcare reform, um, be evidenced in the so-called uh, patient integrated care health homes for the uh, people on, on Medicare with the uh, definition of Medicare being enlarged uh, in 2014. And I really think that the way that healthcare reform is presenting as written right now is extremely friendly to the recovery support services uh, model that I believe should be implemented. And really what's going to be lacking, at least from my perspective, is the science base for the recovery, mm -hmm. for the need for recovery support services, because whilst there are a lot of federal agencies, uh, ONDCP, of course, Department of Education, and SAMHSA at the service level, that are pushing for recovery exp uh, uh, support expansion and calling it recovery has to be research-based. We don't have the funding from so the we NIH. Have practice -based, we uh, have the practice-based evidence. Pra yes, but that's not, you know. <laughs> it's so not empirical. It's not empirical yet. Okay. We're trying. And for prevention, Dr. Peterson, is, 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 are there some similarities? Yeah, you know, with, um, with health care reform, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is um, the coverage of screening and brief intervention in primary health care or other health care settings. Um, I think if you think of uh, going to the doctor 50 years ago and uh, you weren't typically routinely screened for high blood pressure, for example. Now it's done routinely. I think the same um, way of thinking about substance use disorders or mental health disorders uh, in that um, they are something that can be screened for. If detected early, they can be effectively treated. Um, and if you apply this kind of screening universally, then it is, um, it's, a, it's a really good avenue for us to catch problems early, to get people um, education or brief intervention or refer them to the help that they need. And when we come back, we're going to continue to look at some other methodologies that uh, are current and new and that uh, we need to know about. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. 
I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here. And then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Call 1-800-662-HELP. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had and the most important. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Universal Counseling Services is an outpatient mental health and substance abuse treatment program. We are at all the local uh, Department of Social Service sites where we do mental health screenings uh, and referral. We're at the various courthouse sites in the city where we do substance abuse assessments and referrals into the community. Uh, we're in about 13 different Baltimore City public schools where we provide uh, substance abuse and mental health screening as well as um, provide treatment, referral, uh, crisis intervention, and uh, mental health supports for the school system. It can get better, you know. It can get better if you work on it. Try to keep yourself focused. It is very important that we find out what the individual is requesting, what they're in need of, so that we can better address with other organizations problems such as homelessness, HIV, substance abuse co-occurring, and a lot of times legal issues are also in need of. And I thank you for letting me see this second half of your recovery up until the you know, golden time of day. So. Research to practice is using the uh, research that's been shown to be positive for patient outcomes and applying it to practice. What's your top thing on your addictions list? Uh, to keep with the meetings and not slip from them. For a practice to be evidence-based, uh, it would include various models of care that have been tested uh, through research to show positive outcomes. Research also offers statistics and it gives you insight on the demographics, uh, kind of like the breakdown of how you need to help certain cultures, certain age groups, certain socioeconomic statuses, and I think that's where the research is very effective. When a person comes in for substance abuse treatment, if there is an underlying mental health issue, that it be, it be treated simultaneously. I mean, I have social workers and psychiatrists right across the hall from me. You can't just be comfortable with one approach. Substance abuse and mental health, to me, they're best friends, and I always state that in my therapy. Um, you can't really address one without addressing the other. How else will you be able to treat people unless you know what's out there and what resources you can obtain to help them? There's this old stigma that's attached, once an addict, always an addict. And places like this let me know that that's a lie. They don't treat one disease without treating another. It is important that everybody communicates and know and is aware of what the client wants. And in order for them to have a fulfilled recovery process, it is important that everybody is on the same page. You know, when you come in, you try to use your credentials and what you've learned so far in your work experience, you know, to an advantage. But after a while, you can only go so far with that. And uh, you have to, you know, just upgrade yourself and polish your styles of counseling and your techniques because the population you're serving is different than the one you just came from. My hope for the recovery community is that a reconciliation of science and spirituality, that we learn from what science teaches us about the brain and apply it to the more spiritual principles of recovery which talk about what do we want out of life. And there shouldn't be any reason why these two approaches can't coexist. I'm still gonna get me crying. <laughs> It's real important that they understand that we are all in this process. And if I was able to come out of that process successfully and have the opportunity to be able to be of service to help you, then you can do it too. I'm learning that I'm not my disease. 
It's just something that I have. It's not who I am. Make sure that you're paying attention to what's happening in the, in, in the field of research and addiction because it's, it's changing every day and, and uh, you, can't, you, you cannot be stagnant, I don't think, in this field and you can't just be comfortable with one approach. Things are always changing. From a individual practitioner perspective, you feel good about what you're doing because you're providing something that you know will work and that you can see outcomes for, which gives you the reinforcement sometime that you need to know that you're doing a good job and you're in this for the right reason. Dr. Clark, let's go back and talk a little bit more about the whole issue of the parity legislation versus what we're what the ACA brings forward. Um, uh, there was already some stipulations um, that had to be adhered to by the healthcare uh, service delivery system that dealt with substance use disorders as well as mental health illnesses. Well, one of the most important things for us to keep in mind is that both the Affordable Care Act and the Parity Act embrace the notion of uh, dealing with mental health and substance abuse services, but also recognizing that cost is an issue. The advantage of evidence-based practices or the promise of evidence-based practices is that we'll be able to produce acceptable outcomes at reasonable cost. And what we have to do is promote those strategies to uh, service delivery systems, whether it's the integrated system or whether it's the specialty delivery system, or whether it's the primary care system. So that's the conundrum of the research community and the uh, services communities to making sure that whatever we promulgate is cost effective. Tom, uh, in your view, what, it, what would the ideal scenario be in terms of what the ACA brings forward and the special between the, the system, the healthcare system and the specialty care? Should they all be available? Yes, my, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the stage is set for a true revolution in the way uh, behavioral disorders, behavioral health care problems are addressed. I don't think there's anything in my lifetime that's got more promise than the combination of parity and uh, ACA. Um, imagine if we had purchased coverage for diabetes the way we have purchased coverage for addiction. The only people who would get diabetes care in this country are people who would have gone blind or lost one of their fingers because that's the only kind of coverage we've ever had. You had to be at the most severe end of the spectrum in order to even get care. And that care was segregated from the rest of, of health care. You, you've heard many times about the other problems that are associated. Well, they're, they're literally paid for separately with a workforce that's trained differently. Now, as healthcare reform and parity roll out, people at all parts of that continuum ought to be able to get care from being screened early, as Candace says, through uh, interventions in the uh, office of their primary care doctors, to specialty care that they already have and beyond. I think it's going to be really quite an important uh, uh, benefit for people that are affected, but for the rest of medicine as well. We're going to see better quality care and far reduced uh, costs. And you brought in a very good dimension in terms of how we train individuals. Obviously, if we're looking for more people to adopt uh, evidence-based practices, right, Dr. Loday? Wouldn't we really pay attention to how we're training the new people so that to make sure that they really have all the tools uh, that are available in order for them to begin uh, a new practice or in order for them to begin a new um, inclusion into a healthcare system of the mental health and, and the addiction treatment uh, uh, methodologies? That's a, you make a very good point, and I, there's two issues there. There's the fact that within behavioral health care, historically, uh, social workers, for example, and mental health professionals had very different thinking paradigms, different ways of approaching the disorder, and so we need an integration at that level. We also need an integration, and uh, Tom has done some nice, interesting work about that, or looked at that, 
doctor, primary care physicians have to be made aware of the fact that the folks who come into their practice may have other problems. For example, I'm looking at some data of, that I have from a uh, NIDA funded study, people on reco in recovery. And uh, of course, they all have a history of a chronic substance use problem because that's how they ended up in the study. In addition to that, over 50% of them have a chronic physical condition, 72% of whom have more than one. So they have multiple physical hair, uh, care condition. Over a third of them also have a mental health condition. And the co-occurrence of these, when you look at, for example, the odds of developing one or more chronic physical condition as a function of having a mental health diagnosis, is two to three times across samples. So people come in treatment, whether it's substance use treatment or mental health treatment or primary care treatment, <coughs> they're one person with a whole lot of problems. Right. And all of the providers who are professionally in a situation where they're likely to encounter and be called upon to treat these individuals have to be at least more than peripherally aware of the fact that this is going on. And currently in the training this is not happening. And there's also a hierarchy of, of uh, diseases, if I may, where uh, a person treating someone with diabetes or, or any, kind, any chronic condition has a behavioral component. So it's fair to say that even someone with diabetes the behavior may not be stigmatized, but they may be eating too much, mm -hmm. you know. So, but that's not as stigmatized as doing drugs. The other thing that I would add, if I may, is that for people with other chronic conditions, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, what have you, if there is also an existing condition that's a mental health concern or a substance use disorder, untreated, those behaviors affect um, the successful treatment of the diabetes or what have you because of compliance to um, medications, lifestyle changes, whatever. So I would add that. The other thing I would want to add is, is that uh, in the screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment area, grants that SAMHSA gave to the states for demonstration of SBIRT, um, in Wisconsin we elected to do that in primary health care settings. And just a couple of barriers that I want to mention in terms of really implementing that into primary health care settings. One is that primary care physicians simply do not have the time themselves, we found. They see patients for a very short period of time, they deal with an average of seven problems during that short period of time, and to take the time to really talk with somebody and screen them um, about substance use is very, very difficult. So it will require, I think, probably the type of shift in the training that we spoke about earlier. Dr. Clark, I, I want to move on to what is SAMHSA currently doing in terms of workforce development to really begin to get practitioners to understand and to adopt evidence-based practices? Well, says was mentioned, we are working with uh, organized medicine through our expert efforts, through our ATTCs. We also have uh, a medical residency component of our screening brief intervention and referral to treatment strategy. But we are also working with our colleagues at HRSA and uh, the NIH and ONDCP so that we can diffuse that information. It is key to recognize that recovery, as it were, or a public health approach to behavioral health requires a broader overview, not just, as uh, Tom pointed out, not just specialty care. It is the full spectrum of care because some problems are just risky problems. Uh, the person who's drinking three drinks uh, and, have, and has minor problems, if we don't address that, then when we, we, we wait long enough, they'll go from three drinks and minor problems to six drinks and major problems in, in a single setting. So what you want is uh, this integrated recognition and the differentiation of, okay, well, how do we intervene at uh, specific points? And that notion of stage intervention uh, has been uh, raised, and it's an important one. Not everybody needs the same intervention at the same point in time. So what we're promoting is education at all levels, counselors, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, 
working with uh, organized medicine, organized social work, organized psychology, uh, uh, using uh, strategies to help educate existing professionals, because remember, the overwhelming number of existing professionals exceed those who are in training. But So you have to deal with those people who are in training as well as those people who are in existing practice. I was one, of, uh, one of my nephew graduated from um, uh, college, and I was uh, uh, attending his graduation, and his sister's in medical school, and she's going to become an anesthesiologist. And she was, uh, we were talking about drinking. She says, I know, I know. I have to ask, if, should we cut down? Do I get angry? So she was reciting the cage to me, and uh, she's graduating from medical school. So we are obviously having an impact, at least at, at some places where people are sensitive. But her question is, what do I do with the information? Exactly. I, I could add, I, I want to commend SAMHSA on something that I don't see being done anywhere else in medicine, and that is using peers. Um, and there are other places in medicine that, that are seeking to educate the family. The, the fact is this country can't afford the kind of money that it's spending on health care. Families, particularly parents and peers, can be a, a, a real important part of the support services that prevents relapses and, and uh, engages people in treatment. The substance abuse field, and I have to say SAMHSA, has been really a leader in developing that. And it's, I think it's gonna be a real service to the substance abuse field, but I think it's gonna be a big service to medicine generally. When we come back, I wanna to continue to talk about uh, some of the other uh, initiatives that SAMHSA has, such as the ATTC network and everything else that we're doing to promote evidence-based practices. We'll be right back. Recovery benefits everyone. I started my own company. I got my dad back. My friends believe in me. Daddy's home. Substance use and mental disorders can be treated. It all starts on day one. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. National Center for State Courts is a private nonprofit corporation created to promote the rule of law and to work with the state courts in improving the administration of justice. To provide them with information that's going to be helpful to them. We first conduct research of issues that affect the administration of justice. Hopefully we develop some solutions, we pilot test those solutions, come up with best practices. Different kind of scans of the brain. We have an educational arm that we use to produce training programs that we share what we've learned with the leaders in the court field. The Translating uh, Drug Court Research into Practice initiative is part of a general trend in recent years towards more and more emphasis on what does research have to say that can benefit the person who's on the ground. So instead of researchers talking to one another, they're really trying to take our research and make it available to people in ways that can improve the job that they do. The RTP program is a cooperative uh, agreement between the National Institute of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the uh, Office of Criminal Justice Programs, the School of Public Affairs of American University, and the National Center for State Courts. The purpose of the project is really to uh, deliver the best research uh, that's out there, including new and emerging research that will uh, be relevant to the problems that the field is uh, facing. So we came up with the uh, project of trying to develop ways to more timely and in a more interactive way share what has been learned so that people can, as the name implies, move from the theory of the research to put it, putting it into practical application. 
The R2P project tries to help people by condensing through our efforts ahead of time to distill really what is the best evidence that's available that's relevant to the work of people who work in drug courts. So we are then able to, by using experts and by preparing background information, to give people, people the very latest guidance on how they should do their work in order to promote effectiveness in what they are trying to accomplish. It's important to disseminate this information to the practitioners that are out there um, so that they can understand better who's coming to the table, how do they relate to one another at the table, and how can they make the most effective decisions. Understanding that type of research I think is really valuable. It's not only important in translating research into practice, but also translating it in a way that can draw on the experience of practitioners that have tried to use research findings and what are the barriers that they find. I'm trying to take advantage of quick uh, turnaround and quick conveyance to mass audiences of information, but at the same time allowing for the interactivity that will allow people to get a greater grasp of what's being said. The partners to this cooperative agreement that is uh, R2P really get together and they try, we try to figure out what are the most important questions that people who work in drug courts have that we have evidence-based research that can be used to assist them. We then start thinking about what kind of resources should we put together, what kind of people should be involved as experts, and then what the format should be. The issue that we were trying to address when we crafted this project was that there's a, a great deal of good research that's gone on about drug courts and how they function and, and what's effective and what's not. But there's been a struggle to get that information out to the practitioners in a first in a timely way and secondly in a way that is digestible, that it's usable, that is productive. There's so little information that's relevant to uh, actual services quickly available that I think that by making this information available to, in a very practical way, to everyone that's involved, but particularly to the criminal justice practitioner that doesn't normally have access to this, this will help strengthen these programs. Dr. Peterson, um, I want to go to you because you mentioned some of the issues that um, the physicians um, are, are facing in terms of when they do their screening and so on. And you also mentioned off camera that you were attempting to work with them on motivational interviewing skills. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I'm speaking from my experience um, working with trying to implement SBIRT into primary health care settings and uh, emergency departments or emergency room settings in Wisconsin. Um, one of the things that was very difficult in terms of, of the implementation, one I mentioned earlier, that busy physicians, it's, it's very difficult for them to find time. Um, the, the very brief screening itself, however, you can do universally to everybody who walks in the office in a very short period of time, pencil and paper or up on a kiosk, that will give you enough information to know what to do with that person next. Um, that in itself doesn't take the time, but talking to patients does. In Wisconsin, we used paraprofessionals that we trained very intensively to work with people, and uh, that was very effective. They took the time. They were very skilled in motivational approaches, um, and it, the, the, the thing that was also difficult is that there's a lot of stigma around both mental health issues and substance abuse. This affects not only the individual, but it also affects everybody else who grew up in our society, including providers. In Wisconsin, some providers were very reluctant to bring up the subject of somebody's alcohol use with them. They felt it was intrusive. And uh, I think this idea of stigma is really critical for us to address. As long as that is in play, as strongly as it is right now, um, it's going to be a major obstacle for us in getting people to um, agree to treatment, in getting physicians or other health prof professionals to discuss um, behavioral health with their, with their patients. And um, it's something that we really have to take a look at. Well, I tend to be an optimist, so I'm, I'm going to say that 
uh, once people watch the show and, and uh, uh, learn that uh, there are other resources out there that they can learn from, that we will begin to change a little bit uh, some of the minds that need to be changed. Tom. I'd like to comment because I I'm, have the advantage of being old, and I've heard this stigma argument for a very long time, and it keeps going on, and, and the, the kind of behaviors you, you described, Candace, just keep happening. I am not sure that physician, educating physicians and nurses and, and uh, 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 pharmacists about uh, addiction is the way to go. I think when they understand just how profoundly even subdiagnostic levels of alcohol and other drug use affect the rest of the conditions that they're trying to treat and how they've been ignoring that to their own peril. They're not treating the diabetic, the asthmatic, the, the hypertensive patient in, in a professional or, or comprehensive way if they haven't even asked about their alcohol and other drug use. I think that's the kind of thing that's going to make stigma go away. And how do we do that? You, you show them that it is in their interest. And, and Dr. Clark correctly said, this is our chance to show real value to the rest of medicine. If we can show improved outcomes in general health by uh, sh showing that when you do it with the kind of innovative programs that Candace is talking about, you get better cost savings, you get better access, you get better uh, uh, adherence to treatment. Now you got something. I would add to what Tom's, Tom is saying is um, it's not only a matter of, um, although critical, not only a matter of, of helping physicians and other health care professionals see that they are going to get better outcomes, and in the long run it's going to be more cost effective. Yeah. Oh. But, Absolutely. But it, it's also um, a matter of really helping people understand on a very deep level that addiction is not about a failure of um, the will. It's a brain disease and it must be treated as a medical condition on parity with other kinds of chronic conditions. I think that really plays into stigma when and people do not see it as a... Absolutely. And Dr. Clark, I want to go back and, and um, as we're offering the audience uh, uh, a sense of where they can look for information and for training materials, talk a little bit to us about the addiction technology transfer centers and, and the wealth of information that they can provide. Well, our addiction technology transfer centers work with uh, community providers, state authorities, tribes, and, and um, peers so that uh, they would have access to information. We, so you go to our website and you can find information about a wide range of strategies and, and issues. And the theme that keeps surfacing here is that as behavioral health is part of health, uh, you can't deal with health without dealing with behavioral health and our ATTCs help get that information. We also have what's called our, our National Registries of, of Effective uh, uh, Clinical Practice, or NREP, uh, which allows people to identify clinical strategies uh, that uh, have been shown to work for a wide variety of populations. And so they can go to SAMHSA's website and look up NREP and see what kinds of clinical strategies are being employed. So our link with the NIH is an essential one. We have a blending initiative uh, with the National Institute of Drug Abuse where we're promoting effective evidence-based practices and training materials are available so that uh, providers and consumers can get that information. We want to make sure that uh, consumers, peers, families, as well as providers and uh, policymakers uh, are aware of the wide range of information because at the end of the day, uh, stigma and discrimination are also, and the expectation of individuals with regard to mental health and addiction uh, is a cultural phenomenon. When we look at the people who are not engaged in substance abuse treatment, 95% perceive no need for treatment. Even though they meet criteria for abuse or dependence, they perceive no need. It's not that they don't want treatment that they perceive no need for treatment. And that is the conundrum for the healthcare delivery mm -hmm. system. If we don't 
facilitate that awareness at the community level, at the family level, at the employer level, and at the provider level, then we're always going to be dealing with the extremes of these conditions and people will not recognize that they need to change their behavior early. And as Dr. Laudet pointed out, uh, and, and, doc, and Dr. Peters pointed out, if uh, the individual has diabetes and doesn't take his or her medication, hypertension doesn't take medication, cardiac disease and don't take medication because of alcohol or drugs or anxiety or depression, then we're not going to con- we're not going to effectively intervene with those men- those conditions. So, behavioral health is a part of health prevention works, the treatment is effective. We just need to make sure that all of our efforts are synergized so that we get that message out. If I may add to what Dr. Clark just said in terms of the, what the so-called denial gap of the 92% people who need services and, and don't feel the need, I think that part of that may be the stigma. Because, any, I mean, as human beings, I think we don't like to uh, uh, consider the fact that we're not in charge of stuff. So generally, people are being blamed. I mean, people now are almost blamed also for their diabetes and their health. You're not exercising enough, you're eating wrong, and you're smoking, and you know. So the more we're giving people information in terms of the behaviors which they have some power to alter in order to improve their, at the same time, we're kind of blaming them for not taking care of it if they're not. So. Historically, even though the public seems to be increasingly buying into the addictions and disease uh, concept, most people, I think, in the back of their mind, think it's a moral weakness. So that's what underlies the stigma. And who's going to want to cop to the fact that they may have a stigmatized problem and they've been doing bad things? If we were really able to make the same move we've had with, say, cancer, which when I was a child, if somebody had cancer, you whispered it and, and it was like a death sentence. But now people are walking down the street with ribbons and walking and giving money, and it's a, it's a triumph. To well, it be. has been a public it, uh, movement. And it has been somewhat destigmatized, as has, to some, a smaller extent, mental health issues. You've had celebrity people or, or politicians, wives or even politicians, especially once they're out of office sometimes, uh, coming out and saying, I've been treating, usually they're not coming out and saying, I'm being treated for depression now, but they're saying, I've been treated for depression in the past, which kind of, you know, opens the dialogue, but also kind of gets away from the fact that they're okay now. And there's a whole host of other issues we could have touched on related to research to practice, but before the end of the show, I want to remind our audience of National Recovery Month celebrated every September. You can get more information at our website. Thank you for being here, it was a great panel. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click multimedia. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.